Um, thank you for the introduction and it's a great pleasure to be here as part of the Sussex Beacon series. So my talk today is on why technology needs feminism and why the stories we tell are important. So how long did it take for you to discover that this was an ad for computers? <laughs> Apparently in the 1970s, um, the world of microcomputers um, it requires two, two bits are better than one. Um, and I will leave the rest to your imagination. But during this period, computers were not only marketed towards would-be bachelors, they were also advertised as essential and fitting item for the home, an item that fathers and sons uh, could engage in, not necessarily an item for women, for daughters or for mothers. And I particularly like this image over here because it, it's basically saying the best way to buy a computer is to get your kid to do it. <laughs> the mother looks on in the background grinningly and the, and the sales rep has this kind of weird grin on his face as well. Um, but these are just a fraction of the images in this period which tell a particular story of computing. It tells a story of who computing is for and who, who computing is not for, who is close to. A story which frames this technology as a technology for men, as a technology for boys, something that might attract the attention of a, um, of a, a woman or the approving smile of a mother, but not a technology for women. And while these are from the 1970s, and we may think, well, that's history, the stories we, that is society, history, um, our families, our communities, our government and our ad advertisers tell are important. They shape us. They also, in some respect, control us. Whether they are national histories um, which perpetuate harmful stereotypes or stories of great heroes which perpetuate myth of greatness while hiding some essential truths. And we know that stereotypes are dangerous. We know that stereotypes are enduring. And as these images reflect, stereotypes are often based on gender. So these images present a narrative which designates roles, designates responsibilities, and critically designates capabilities. And stereotypes have lasting effects. So what happens when we tell women they have no role in emergent, cutting edge technology? Well, this. So this is a graph um, which tracks the percentage of women um, in major fields in the United States. And it's asking what happened to women in computer science. And you can see that from the 1960s, there's a kind of cluster of, of, of women entering these fields and, and the growth of the percentage of women in these fields up until the 1980s. And just as the advent of the personal computer begins to gain traction, we see a significant drop in the number of women taking computer science majors. And it continues to 2010 and beyond. It never really gains an upward um, cycle again. And the reasons for these are multiple. And of course, advertising is just one aspect of a complex socio-economic cultural context. And the net effect is still um, felt today. So if I was to ask you, in 2021, UCAS reported on the percentage of women in computer science. What would you hazard a guess of that percentage being? Kate is smiling. 5%. 5%. It's not as bad as that. 17%, which I think is significant when you think about, you know, the, the dip and where it's going. It isn't moving, okay? And so given these stats, who then is surprised of technological algorithmic and AI bias? Who is coding and for who? Bias embedded in our technologies are not just gendered, they are racialized. They are classists, they are ableist, and they reflect, as Rua Benjamin writes, the cultural, political, and legal codes of society. Bias in society is bias in technology. We should treat them as one and the same. There are plenty of examples of technological bias. We know it exists, yet often we don't know the full implications until much later in the life cycle of a system or of a project. And of course, your experiences and my experiences of that bias will be very different. I think also critically, the people and the communities most affected are probably not even in this room. Um, and indeed, the literature in the, in the field, which includes Safi Noble's Algorithms of Oppression, in which they explore Google search results, which perpetuate sexist and racist stereotypes, and Virginia Eubanks in Automated Inequality, 
which explores the way in which automated data collection uh, systems further marginalize and disadvantage the most vulnerable in society attest to this. We are in a critical turning point in society. We're on the brink of climate disaster, society faces additional existential crises of our own making. And we simply cannot forego our responsibilities to create technologies that work for all. And in this respect, technology needs intersectional feminism. It needs techno-feminism. It needs eco-feminist uh, um, feminism. It needs these perspectives, these methods, and these praxis. And feminism, like techno-feminism, for example, challenges gendered stereotypes in relation to technology and science. It offers and indeed demands us to view technology within the context it was built. That is as a result of capitalist patriarchy. It is, as Judy Wiseman states, um, a way to prompt us to consider the cultures and practices associated with technologies and not just the technologies themselves. Feminist traditions in science and technology studies also remind us of the need to reclaim and retell the story of women and technology to call out the cultures and practices which have systemically sidelined and hidden women's contributions. So what if we told the real story of women in computing? What if instead of narratives like this, which portray the woman as an outsider, she's in the domestic space, um, she's an onlooker on, on the technology, she's admiring, I presume it's her husband. So what if narratives like this, which portray women as the onlooker, or narratives like this. Um, so the woman can be a doctor, but she can't use a computer. She needs a man to do that. What if these stories were set alongside stories like this? That in the 1960s, there was a moment when women in programming was a good thing. And while the wording is slightly sexist in a lot of places in this uh, particular um, magazine, the possibilities of their involvement at least was there. That until the possibilities of computing as a multi-billion dollar industry were fully realized, it was seen as an administrative task suitable for women. What if we also told that before electronic computing, a computer was a person who performed a variety of ma mathematical tasks and computers were predominantly women? And what if we told the story that pioneers of computing during World War II, namely the operators and programmers of the ENIAC, so that's the electronic, numerical, integer and computer, were all women and who, despite documentary evidence like this, uh, were unnamed until, un, until the 1990s, were commonly referred to as models, even though they learned how to operate the machines without a manual. What if we highlight the fact that the secret history of the ENIAC women, as uncovered by Cathy Kleiman, was just one example of hidden histories of women in computing and engineering. And I think at this point, we probably are all aware of the Hidden Histories um, movie and book. It's part of a history, a story, a narrative that has, that has hidden women's, um, specifically in the case of, of Hidden History, has hidden the, the contributions of women of color and told us that computing is not a domain for women. All of this would perhaps indicate to us that sexism in these spaces is a feature and not a bug. And as such, the potential to change is there. And that potential to change is embracing intersectional feminist practice. It's, it's embracing techno-feminist practice. It's embracing eco-feminist practice. And so there are plenty of ways in which feminism can help technology. But I wanted to highlight uh, here specifically the work of uh, full-stack feminism in digital humanities. And um, so as Alice mentioned, Full Stack Feminism is a two-year AHRC IRC funded project. So IRC is the Irish Research Council. And critically embraces intersectional feminist theories and praxis. And it considers how feminist methods like a feminist ethics of care can be utilized and foreground in the development of computational technologies. It engages and develops methods to create digital technology that is more reflective of our society and more representative of the diversity of experiences. So a feminist ethics of care prompts us to think about things like, well, who is doing the coding? Who is creating the technology? And who does that technology empower? And who does that technology disempower? Important questions um, around power are prompted by feminism. It also prompts us to think about who is writing the code. In that sense, whose values, whose bias do they reflect? 
can we or can you give agency or empowerment to different voices within that space? Um, and there's a great quote from Rua Benjamin who says, users get used. So how are we in building these systems, whatever that is, how are we protecting the interests of marginalized voices? How are we protecting the interests of these concerns? Um, we can also think about you know, how we collect data. How is that mandated and when is it a choice? In particular, I'm kind of, for the work that I do around gender and archives, a particular thing around ethics of care is that language matters. Language can hurt, words hurt. So what about breaking from the binary, hacking the systems, thinking about outside the kind of binary uh, negotiations of gender and binary negotiations of um, identity. In AI systems and machine learning, there's often talk about margins of error within systems of classifications or margins of error within systems of recognition. And the question is though, what margin of error is tolerable? And what are what, tolerable to who and acceptable to who? If you are in that margin of error, then certainly it's not tolerable. Another key thing is about thinking about transparency and accountability. And this comes down to thinking about care for community, care for environments and care for collaborations. These are all things that a feminist access of care will, will, will inform us to think about more responsibly and more uh, transparency. And accountability in these spaces is about thinking about the way in which our work has ramifications outside of these spaces. And the last kind of prompt on, on this slide anyway, is who can refuse these things and who cannot? Acknowledging a position of privileges is, is, is very important in these spaces as well. And so in kind of wrapping up, I want to think about maybe four key things from a feminist ex of care in terms of thinking about why feminism needs technology and why the, the stories we tell are important. So what would it mean if we developed slower? What, if it, what would it mean if we developed with empathy? What if they were the value systems that we embedded in our life cycles for software development? And what does it mean to collaborate with intention, not just as an afterthought, but actually intently thinking about who we collaborate, whose voices we include, and who we think about has, has expertise. A, a critical thing about full stack feminism is that we look at the way in which we can decenter expertise, knowing that everyone in this room has a voice, but that people outside of this ro uh, room have an equal voice as well. And what if we questioned who is a feminist? I asked Google Bards what fem feminism could do for technology. And all the answer it says was, feminists could do this, feminists could encourage, feminists could advocate. The question there is who, did, who does Bard and who does society think feminists are? So it's not for me as a self-proclaimed feminist to do this work, it's for us all, okay? So thinking about who is a feminist, questioning that. And lastly, what if stories from the past could inform our future? What if we told these stories to our computer science undergrads? What if we told these stories to computer science undergrads who are working with historians um, to reclaim or to kind of retell these stories, to empower, to advocate, to provide agency? And I will leave it there. Thank you.